And this big mess of wires you see on the ground here is a uh, floor cord for fencing. What that is, uh, you hook it between the scoring machine and your body cord, which connects to your weapon. It's used for electric scoring. It's about uh, 40 feet long. It's got three conductors in it, and uh, it's got a uh, XLR connector on one end, which is just something that we put on ourselves. And the blue connector there is a three-pronged banana jack connector. Uh, Normally, this thing should be a straight connection uh, all the way through on three wires with no shorts, but this has developed an intermittent short between the A and the B lines, the ones that connect your uh, tip on your EPE. So it constantly registers a hit, even though you don't have anything connected to it. Now, these cords, they're uh, put on a pulley system, and they're under constant tension, and they're constantly being uh, moved across this pulley, so there's a lot of flexing in this thing and a lot of tension, so... Uh, normally they would uh, break and form an open circuit, but this has a short circuit between the two lines. So we're going to go ahead and try to diagnose this. Instead of just blindly trying to figure out where the short is, uh, we can salvage some of this if we can use some test and measurement equipment, specifically TDR, time domain reflectometry, to figure out where the short is. I can take my multimeter here and let's probe between the A and the B lines. This is where the short is. It should be an open, but nope, we're getting around 2-3 ohms of resistance. If I probe from A to C, it's an open, and B to C, it's an open. But we go back here, and uh, there's definitely a short. Uh, one way you could diagnose this is you could put some current through the line and figure out where it's getting hot. Uh, you'd end up possibly burning your short out, and it could show up later. So we want to use a more scientific method of diagnosing this. Uh, you know, we could run current through the line, not enough to heat it up, and maybe look at the... Uh, the uh, potential drop between the end here and the other end of the cable and use that uh, to try to figure out approximately linearly where the short is down the line. Uh, but there's a better way to do it using the TDR method. All right, the way TDR works is you start off with a pulse generator right here. But what's important is the rise time of this pulse, not necessarily the width, but how fast it can go from a low to a high uh, transition. So that pulse is going to go through a 50-ohm uh, uh, internal resistance right here, which is built into most decent uh, uh, RF generators. So the pulse, And this is important because it's going to absorb any reflections that are going to come back so they don't go back for another bounce. Anyway, the pulse travels past what I call the reference plane, and that's where the oscilloscope is attached. The oscilloscope has to have a high impedance. Uh, so it doesn't uh, load the pulse. It also has to have a very short connection between its internal uh, 1 megaohm resistance and there's a shunt capacitance with that and where the reference plane is so we don't get any reflections off that. Uh, the, the connection between this 50 ohm source and your reference plane can be a decent 50 ohm cable. What's important is you put your reference plane at the beginning of the cable length where you want to find the distance to the fault. Anyway, this pulse is traveling down the line here, which can be long. In our case, it's going to be 37 feet. And it's going to hit a load over here, and it's going to reflect back. So on your scope, you're going to see an initial pulse, followed by some delay time, and then a return pulse. And this return pulse can either have a positive amplitude of the uh, discontinuity over here as an open, or if it's going to have a negative one, it's a short circuit. And the open could be a, also characterized by a capacitance, or excuse me, an inductance, and the uh, uh, short could be a uh, large capacitance. Anyway, if you measure the uh, time between the, the first pulse and the second pulse, and you divide that by two, since it's a two-way trip down the cable, down and back, multiply that by the speed of light, you can find the distance from the beginning of the cable to where the reflection occurred. That also has to be multiplied by V, the velocity factor. Uh, typical velocity factor for uh, RF coaxial cables is around 70% or so because they have a Teflon dielectric and they're encased in a full dielectric with no air. This cable, is, since it's just a, a regular uh, uh, duty cable, it's probably going to have something maybe a little bit lower than this or higher depending on what the dielectric is and how much air is in there also. Anyway, the the bandwidth required for the oscilloscope is related to the rise time. The signal generator I'm using has a minimum 6 nanosecond rise time, which isn't great for P TDR. There's uh, stuff that have uh, sub-picosecond rise times for extremely good resolutions, but this is limited to 6, which is what you get for a few hundred dollar generator. Anyway, the bandwidth you need for the oscilloscope is going to be uh, 
approximately 0 0.35 divided by that rise time, which I have here as delta, which comes out to about 58 megahertz. So you can do this with a, a standard 100, 100 megahertz scope. Now we have two discontinuities. The uh, resolution you're going to be able to get is half that rise time times the speed of light. And that comes out to about 0.9 meters in our case, but uh, we can actually probably do it a little bit better in X. We, there's probably only one short here, and there, it's contained in one area, so we can get that down to within three feet of that 40-foot uh, cable. That's doing pretty good, and we're not going to trash the whole cable. We can recover some of it. This is a new pulse generator I picked up last week, uh, and it just so happens that I ended up getting this cable about a week after I got this, so it's a good opportunity to try some TDR experiments. Anyway, this is a Siglin SG, SDG5082. It, it's a, one of the new 5000 series Siglin uh, generators. And the nice thing about this is that it allows you to do extremely narrow uh, rising edges or pulse widths, even if you go to very low pulse rates. Uh, some of the other ones, if you go down to like a 1 um, hertz pulse repetition rate, uh, you're still stuck with like a 1 millisecond minimum pulse width. With this thing, you can essentially do a digital impulse you can see it's uh, 80 megahertz is the analog bandwidth on this thing, but it'll do 500 mega samples per second. So when you narrow it down to what they call here, it's saying it's a 6 nanosecond rising edge and a 12 nanosecond pulse width, that's essentially a 0, 1, 0, a digital impulse coming out of your uh, uh, D to A converter and going through the uh, anti-aliasing filters. So uh, they sell an 80 megahertz at the low end, the higher end is 160. More than likely the anti-aliasing filtering is the same which is going to be somewhere less than 250 mega samples per second, maybe a third of that. So this will have the same pulse width as the higher uh, uh, dollar generators. It just can't do as fast as a uh, fast of a uh, sine wave or you know a waveform. That's software limited, not in the hardware. So you can get pretty good value for this thing. Anyway, you can see I've got it set to one megahertz uh, rate with a one volt peak to peak, and then the minimum. Uh, pulse with the 12 nanoseconds, which is a 6 nanosecond uh, rising and falling edge. And internally, the load is set to 50 ohms. Coming out of the uh, signal generator here, you can follow the uh, coaxial cable. It goes over to my Tektronix uh, 2465 BDM scope. This is a 400 megahertz band with a scope. Uh, this is made in the uh, early 90s. It's about the highest band bandwidth analog uh, scope that Tech made before they switched to sampling scope, so it's it's really nice. And I prefer using this thing compared to the uh, uh, Tech Digital scope right there, which is great for single shot work, but doesn't have the bandwidth, and it's just you know not a lot nicer to use this thing. So I've got the uh, time base uh, zoomed all the way in here, and I've got that that pulse going there. You can see it is about a six nanosecond rise time. Rise time is from the 10% amplitude up to the 90% amplitude. So it's, it's a pretty narrow pulse, even though it looks wide here on the scope. And my reference plane is going to be right where I've got this 50 ohm resistor attached right now. So I pull this resistor off, you can see that the pulse amplitude is going to go up a lot because it doesn't have the attenuation. And we're going to get a little bit of a bounce right here because we don't have a nice uh, termination on the end here. So what I've got right here is at the reference plane, I've connected a, uh, a pigtail uh, banana connection right here, which goes to the A and the B lines on a floor cord. This is a good floor cord. It's got no shorts in it. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to be able to measure the velocity factor. I don't want one that's broken. So uh, the pulse travels down the line. This is the initial pulse that you see right here. It's going to travel down a line to the end here through its uh, approximately 40 feet, reflect off this open circuit, and come back. And that's the return pulse where I've got the second marker. So you can see there's a 140 nanoseconds approximately between the two. Now I know that's where the open is because if I take and add some capacity, and you'll see that the pulse starts to get a little bit lower in amplitude. If I take and short circuit that, the scope will re-trigger, but now that pulse is inverted amplitude and it's going towards uh, uh, negative. You can see the difference here. So now what I need to do is measure the length of this thing and knowing the distance between them, I can count the electrical uh, delay, I can calculate the velocity factor of this good cable. And then we're going to measure the bad cable and be able to figure out where the fault is. Now I've put the bad cable on the end here, and there's a big difference in the response. Uh, again, the initial pulse, if we've got the return pulse, we know that it's a approximately 3 ohms, so it's a short circuit, uh, essentially. And you can see it's a large negative amplitude pulse, and it's at... Uh, 
approximately uh, 50 nanoseconds. So now we can uh, measure the cables and do the math, figure out the velocity factor of the good cable and then try to figure out where the fault is in the bad cable. I've done since several years ago, I laid all the, uh, my wife and I laid all the floor tile in this basement. I've laid these cables out and they run the entire length of the house. And uh, uh, laying all this damn tile, I know that these things are exactly on 12 inch center. So we run past the long arm quilting machine, past the pool table, all the way in the back of the lab. So I've been able to measure these cables uh, just using the floor tiles. Let's go back and do the math. All right, now I've got the uh, known good cable right here. We're going to call this D sub E, the uh, delay electrical. I know that's 140 nanoseconds, so we divide that two to get down to the single trip time. Multiply that by the uh, speed of light. So that comes out to 21 meters or 68.9 uh, feet. And this is the electrical uh, length of things. So we need to figure out, uh, we've been able to measure the, uh, the physical, and we divide, which is 37 feet, divide that by the electrical, and that gives us a velocity of propagation, which is 53.7%. It's actually lower than the Teflon coaxial cable I was talking about earlier, but we're not sure of the dielectric makeup of this thing. It's probably vinyl or some other uh, heavier insulation. Now, we know the bad cable. Uh, doing the same calculation for its delay, I use 49.5 nanoseconds divided by 2 times the speed of light times 57.3 velocity factor. That comes out to 3.99 meters or 13.1 feet or approximately 13 feet 1 inch. Start at the end here and start counting off floor tiles at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and 1 inch. And I put a red mark right there where I think the fault is going to be in the cable. All right, so I've got the bad cable hooked back up to the scope. And I've uh, got the, the area marked in red where I think the, the issue is. Now, if I take and you can see if I start squeezing here, it's really not doing anything. Let's get, get towards the red mark. It's still not doing much, but uh, now let's keep going. Now you can see it's starting to change a little bit. You can feel the cable's kind of rough right here, too. So I go past that a little bit more. You can see there, it's really starting to affect it. And there we go, look at that right there. I twist it right there. It's actually, re the scope is changing its trigger point. So I, th I think the fault is probably about right, uh, if you go back here, it doesn't do anything. I want to say the fault is probably, uh, I'd say right here. So I'm going to take and mark this with a piece of yellow tape. The twist back here doesn't do too much. Twist right there, there, right there, yeah. So you can see it's about a pretty, pretty darn close, about a seven inch distance to where uh, I thought the fault was and where it, where it probably is. So now we can uh, cut this open right here. Let's try to find out what kind of damage was caused to this wire. And here's the wire. I've gone ahead and cut the uh, outer jacket off this thing. You can see it's a uh, metal braid. Uh, looks like stainless steel underneath. And this, this is already really frayed. This is not for me cutting it. This is from running back and forth across that pulley and being torn. You can see right here uh, one of the red wires uh, already starting to show through. So cut this thing open a little bit more and see if we can find the fault. And I find the fault in this wire, if you look at the red wire, the insulation is peeling back uh, right here and exposing the, uh, the inner conductor. And there's another section on the white wire back here where it's also peeling away. Uh, what I think was happening is it was shorting against the uh, uh, stainless steel braid right here and causing that intermittent uh, short. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut this section out right here and let's see if that fixes the issue. Anyway, now I can go back and uh, test these sections of wire, the multimeter. You can see everything's, a, uh, everything's an open. If I test the other side too where the XLR, XLR connector is, it's also an open. So it's kind of obvious because we you know, cut out, cut some wire out. We didn't cut that much out though. We cut out about, uh, about four inches. So that seems to fix the problem. We saved a lot of cable with... Uh, out having to waste a bunch to find out where the short is. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video.